What is up, beloved? We are back for another episode. Got a very special guest coming on. It's going to be Larry Johnson, former NFL player, two-time Pro Bowler. Larry Johnson is going to be joining the show in just a moment. You can find Larry on Instagram at 2LarryJohnson7, and his backup account is Sight to the Blind. Sight number 2, the blind, and 2LarryJohnson7 are his Instagram accounts. You can find me on Instagram at Wilson Ryan underscore underscore. My Twitter is Ryan Michael 11. And you can email the show at pod.tpr at gmail.com. If you're new to this show, this podcast series is TPR, the Positivity Report. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and a lot of the other platforms that you might listen to your podcasts on. This is TPR, the Positivity Report. I'm your host, Ryan Wilson, and we're going to be bringing Larry Johnson on in just a moment. What's up, Larry? How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate you coming on. Oh, no problem, fam. So if you're all good, we're really just going to get right into it. So I think the most obvious question that people always want to hear from you, and I know that you speak about this a lot, so we're not even going to spend a lot of time on this. We'll get to more important topics. But seeing as you played in the NFL, had such a successful career in the NFL, how obvious is it to you now, years later, that not just the NFL, but pro sports in general are scripted and rigged? I mean, you're asking how much, how do I feel about it now? Yeah. Uh, that's what I, I knew something was always iffy with it. When I, even when I played, I understood that when I was playing sports that you put the best men on the field and you win games. When I understood when I came in as a, as a rookie, it wasn't, it didn't work that way. It was so many moving parts to it, so much things I didn't understand, but kind of understood from far away. And then when I came out of the game, it made complete sense why some games I never did anything good. And then some games I just would walk all over uh, players. But when we got to the playoffs, I could tell things were a little scripted and things didn't go as planned because – when you know defenses, you know there's always a chink in the defense. Now, <laughs> it's like if you ever played Tech Mobile, where you know how you play, you select the same play as your your the guy you're going against, and the the play just goes all to hell. It's like it was like that. I was like, there's no way in the world these people can keep guessing this play. It's no way. And then when I came out of it, I was like, yeah, it makes sense. I used to beat myself up. Uh, thinking like, man, I never made it to the Super Bowl. I never made it past the first round of the playoffs. And then when I understood Gematria and how it was rigged, I was like, well, it, w it just wasn't in the numbers for me to go. So I did, I, it was a burden lifted off my shoulders. I mean, yeah, it was fun to play, and you run the, the plays that are, are assigned to you, but you know you could change those plays and you can make those plays work or fail if you've had offensive coaches and defensive coaches under the same Masonic umbrella, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting because, you know, we have former players like you talking about the games being rigged. You have people talking about Gematria, showing the numbers, how it's rigged. But for some reason, a lot of people really just refuse to believe it. So do you think it's a spiritual reason and a deeper reason of why people can't admit it or come out of it? People that are just watching the games? I mean, it's, it is spiritual because we have to understand that the everyday Joe Schmo, he does his nine to five and all he has to to get to put all that frustration and all that rage and all that stress and being bogged down in these jobs that they're bogged down into. They have what they need a release. So they attach themselves. We're very tribal people. We attach ourselves to what we think is going to give us that release, give us that pleasure. And so we don't want anyone tampering with that pleasure. So a lot of guys will fight you tooth and nail all the way down to the bone when you try to expose them that these games are rigged. If they can't see it, like blatantly see it, they won't believe it. It's almost like WWF wrestling. We know it's fake, but until they come out and say, hey, we are telegraphing our moves. If you And if you see them say, hey, I'm going to throw you into the turnbuckle. If those guys don't see it, they will never awaken to these things being rigged that way. Yeah, definitely. And as far as the players in the league, do you think that some of them might have cognitive dissonance of their own. Like I think LeBron James, Tom Brady, they probably know that the, the leagues are scripted, I would guess. Mm -hmm. But for the majority of the players and just 
regular players in these leagues, do you think it's not in their best interest to want to look into it further and, and really dig deep? Um, I think they, some of them suspect it. I think at NBA, because it's, they're smaller teams, they almost all have to know what these guys are involved with. They all know who's a Mason, who's not a Mason. You have to know. It's five or six, what, what seven, maybe seven, eight guys on a team, a basketball team. They all travel together. They all do their dirt together. They have to know who's involved and who's not involved. So they had, you know, when it comes to uh, football, it's too many guys. You can't control that many guys. You can tr- you could control the quarterback and maybe a couple of defensive players. So the other guys, I don't know if they really care enough. I mean, when I was in the league, all I care about was getting that check every Wednesday. Everything else really didn't matter to me. Politics didn't matter. Scripture at that time really didn't matter. So, you know, those guys are just spiritually blinded by now, only by the things that they put their their attention to. Yeah. And before we transition to scripture, kind of to help us get there, how did you make that transition from being in the NFL, living worldly pretty much, to then coming back to the most high, being a warrior for the most high and doing the work that you're doing now? To tell you the truth, it wasn't it wasn't pretty. It was literally uh, I was purged from it. I left the game in 2012. From 2012 to, I guess, 2016, I was heavy into Molly, MDMA, ecstasy. I was into the house music scene down here in Miami because I lived so close to the nightclubs. That was my life. It was like the most I literally had to pull me out kicking and screaming. I did not want to leave that life alone. And when friends started to turn on me, uh, bloodlines, families started to turn on me. That is when I had nowhere else to go. You know, I, you know, my money was going here and there. I couldn't control it. And I really had nowhere to go. I was in a desperation act. I mean, I always prayed to, you know, I, at that time I call him God. I always prayed to the most high, but it was only for my own selfish reasons. Oh, please don't let me get hurt in this game. Please, you know, let me keep doing this and doing this. Um, so it came to a point where I was just, I was done. I was tired of myself. And, and only when you get tired of yourself is when you, need somebody else to pick you up and somebody else who's not going to abandon you or leave you. So the most high was the only person I knew at that time. And I fell on my knees, cried, bawled my eyes out. And that's what really started it. And then I devoted my time into trying to searching for more. And it really started with the hip hop industry. I wanted to know, you know, why these guys are all of a sudden throwing up the devil horns. No one threw up the devil horns in black music since, you know, since its inception, no one was out here doing, you know, Six six sisters. So when I looked into that, I kind of bumped into a video uh, that was talking about the Israelites. And that is when it's, it's somehow connected with my soul because I started crying. And then that's when it, that's when my awakening started. And I feel like that happens to a lot of people is they'll be looking into like conspiracies, like you said, the hip hop industry. And I always say, if you do this walk correctly, all the conspiracies, all the gematria, anything that you look into will lead you right back to the most high. Mm-hmm. It's like you say, if you shred it, it, it goes to religion, music, politics. Any, if you shred it down to its last atom, it'll eventually lead to the most high because you understand everything is fake. And so yeah. you want to know what's real. Yeah. And, and there's no, there's nowhere else to go. Once you go through it all, it's like the most high, that's it. And you also start to see why all this wickedness exists because of the most high, because he's allowing it, ordaining it. So that really is the bottom line to everything. I mean, it's it's really, you got to be either under a rock or just want to be deaf, dumb, and blind to not see this stuff. Because now it's in our faces every single day. You really have to be a low frequency, low vibrational person to be like, no, nah, you know, they just making them. I've seen the excuses. You've seen the excuses. No, they make them do this because they're just trying to get this money. <laughs> this money. Like they make excuses for them, but it's in our faces because the most high is putting it in our faces. So it's like, okay, you have no excuse to come out of it. No one, you can't say, well, nobody told me like, duh, we've been showing you. Yeah. We showed you, they told you like, so I I think people just really refuse to see it. They don't want to see it. And why does the most high pick from the pit? As you often say, why does, why is it best for him to have people literally fall down, whether it's spiritually, financially, emotionally, literally be broken and then rise those people up. Why does he pick from the pit? Well, I would ask you this. Why do you think Satan does the same exact thing? 
where he picks from the broken homes and broken art because he knows people will follow it. The, the story and the mantle is much more authentic when you see somebody from the bottom. So when the most high, you know, picks us from the pit, it's because he's using those who've had a past. So his thing is, all right, watch me. Do, what did you seen him do without me? Now watch what you see me do with him with me and so when he rises us up people are like oh this is authentic this is real and that's what i think a lot of people don't understand when they see celebrities like Kyrie irving and kanye say black jew or israelites or yah you don't understand like they have to lose that platform the most high is, his platform is not espn it's not abc it's not you know cbs it's literally nothing it's from the bottom up and then what we see or what the people that we are paying our attention to as far as the truth aren't really celebrities and i think that's why he picks so he's like makes us more authentic knowing that we have more power over satan's influence than the other way around yeah and it, it's so obvious to see that kanye and Kyrie are psyops and it's it's really frustrating that a lot of awakened people are falling for it and i think people get confused like you say, oh, well, if there's a celebrity in the mainstream, then they have to be owned by Satan. Mm -hmm. And then people will say, oh, well, Larry's a celebrity, but it's like, you don't have a platform anymore. You were a celebrity, if you want to say that 10 years ago, like, mm -hmm. I think people misunderstand what the mainstream is and, and they can't tell the difference of someone who's still on the mainstream platforms versus you. Like you're just doing your own thing, your own podcasts, using social media. Like, so I think people get confused about that. But I always see people saying that like Larry's a celebrity, but you're really not like, and you know, you know, a lot of it has to do with, they don't see the repercussions of what I say. See, they think if you are not a celebrity and you say the things that celebrity says that you should be destroyed, like they go bankrupt you or sacrifice you or kill you. They think that they think there's a, an Illuminati or Freemasonic assassination squad for regular people. It's, it doesn't work that way. They can't control us that way. It's, I think people see what on TV and be like, oh, if they say it on TV, it has to be protected. It has to be real. If we say it, it's a danger. That's why I think people need to reverse their thinking with that. Like, a lot of times when we say things, it's easily information that you could Google. It's not that hard to find out these things. It, it all depends if you have the courage to stand up and live by that word. That's what makes you know, us different from, from, from uh, celebrities. Yeah. And that's definitely part of the fear mongering that they push is they want regular people to be afraid to speak out because they, they want they want people to think that there's some assassination squad that's going to go around killing people uh, if you speak out. And I think people also forget that once you're in the hand of the most high, Yah is protecting you. So people always, I think, forget that part that Yah has to allow someone to be taken out. Exactly. Like he says, like, uh, none can deliver from his hand. Like when it's said and done, they get, when he protects you, he protects you. It's, I've, I've tried it a couple of times. It's not, I've been put in situation where friends and family members tried to sacrifice me based on the allegiance that they're with. I just know how to sniff it out. It was only by the most high exposing it to me, exposing these traps and snares and say, all right, I'm going to save you out of this. So you know who to be around and who not to be around. I was distant from my family, I'd say three years ago, I never understood why. I was fighting to be a part of my, my family and it just, Most High kept separating me. And so when these traps happened, I was like, oh, this is the reason why. And I started seeing examples, you know, how other guys like, for example, for example, uh, Steven Jackson, I think he played for the Buccaneers and the Chargers. That same week, I was asked to do an autograph signing in a hotel ballroom. Didn't do, didn't want to tell me what hotel it was. Just saw an uh, autograph signing. I didn't do it because I, I sniffed it out. A couple of days later, Vincent Jackson is found dead in a hotel room. This could have been me if I didn't pay attention. So I, I, just, I understood the traps and this is how these people move. Yeah, definitely. And Satan has to get permission spiritually before anything can manifest in the physical. And I think people don't understand that aspect. And in the book of Job, that's that's what really shows us that. So I think that's one of the most important concepts to understand with all of this, that it's literally all spiritual and then things can manifest in the physical after. Mm -hmm. And also, as far as like the most high picking from the pit, why does he also raise up people that to tell people the truth who they don't want to hear it from. 
I man, I think about that a lot. That's a good. I really do think about it. I'm like, why me? He know my mouth is crazy. He know people don't like me. I don't know. I think it's a humble thing. I think it's a humility thing. I had to go through it too. I had to go through a humility thing, but a different aspect of it. Um, it was at a time where I had no money, and I had to, and I couldn't get hired by a regular job. I literally sold boosted makeup, boosted women's makeup, in a suit in the hot streets of Miami in the summertime. Like that was him humbling me. So when it comes to people who speak the truth and he's picking people who are strong willed and he know he picking people who are literally savages to this, to this world. I don't know. He picks people who can, can withstand it. Like I've been hated in Kansas city for like doing dumb things. I, I was rightfully hated. Now I have this thick shield over me or this thick skin where now I love being hated by people who know that I'm doing it the righteous way, that I'm doing it the right way. But I, I still, to this day, I just can't figure out why he choosing those who, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, like I said, I just, I truly believe it's just a thing where, okay, well, you don't like this person. I'm going to make him say the truth and I'm going to make you humble by it to where you have to change your spirit. You have to change your soul in order to hear the truth. Cause it's not me that they're hearing. They're hearing the most high. So if you can hear me through somebody you don't like in the flesh, you can hear me a lot more once you find me through these, this person's words. And I think uh, the Most High wants people to focus on the message rather than the messenger. I think people get caught up on the physical and like they don't like this person or whatever the case may be so that they miss the message because they're so focused on who the messenger actually is. And I think that's purposeful. Yeah, I think that, that always goes back to First Samuel when he talked to... Uh to Samuel about um, Saul, he said, men choose from the outward appearances, but I don't do that. So I look at the heart and that is why he was rejected because Saul obviously was a man of stature. I don't know if he was good looking, but obviously he stood out in the crowd. And the most I said, I don't pick because of how he looks. I pick from the heart. And this is, you know, once his heart, Saul's heart changed, and he went away from the Most High. He chose David. And then from David, it wasn't because of David's stature. He chose him because of David's heart. Yeah, definitely. And something that you speak about a lot, uh, which I really like, is about the true biblical locations, like true Jerusalem being in South Africa and a lot of the biblical locations being in Africa. Uh, what can you say about that? I mean, it's it's tough. It's re you really have to search out these old maps, but they tell you it's no way in the world that all these scriptural towns have been spaced out in Africa and all of a sudden they show up in a small spot that's no bigger than New Jersey. You have to think about that. It's 12 tribes. I'm talking about we got cattle, we got sheep, we got livestock. You trying to tell me 12 tribes and all the families that are associated are living in a spot no bigger than New Jersey? They would be on top of each other. Yeah. So when, when I look at these, these scriptural towns in African areas, it makes more sense. The land of milk and honey, why would it be in a desert in Israel where – it literally wasn't no, it wasn't even called Israel. It was called Idumea in some of these ancient maps. Yeah, th there's no way. And I love when you say that a, a place no bigger than Jersey, because it, it's so true. And it, it really just makes so much sense. Like, I feel like once you understand who the true Israelites are, once you find out where the true land is, it really brings everything together so much better. Like, it, it felt like things were missing. And then once you find out the truth of these points, it, it really makes so much more sense. And I love when you bring out the, the ancient maps and it, it really shows how deep the deception is in our world of them dwarfing Africa on, on our maps that they give us today. And it, I think it really shows how hard they're going to, to keep this deception up by changing all of this. Uh, let me ask you, how did you find out that we were the Israelites. Like, how did you come into it? Pretty much through you. Uh, in 2020, pretty much when, when Kobe died, I started looking into Gematria. And because I was like, this, there's something not right with this. And a lot of uh, celebrity deaths previously had been very odd to me. Like when Mac Miller died, like I mm -hmm. thought that was really weird. So then when the Kobe thing happened, I was like, there, there's no way this, this is organic or natural. So the first thing I found was Gematria. And as soon as I found that, and I actually saw your interview with Zach Hubbard at Gematria mm -hmm. Effect, 
Mm -hmm. And as soon as I started learning this information, I knew I had to get back in the scriptures. Like, like, just like you, all these conspiracies and gematria brought me back to the most high. So I got back in the scriptures, starting, started reading it early in 2020, you had uh, the first version of your podcast sight to the blind. So I would listen to those episodes. I heard you saying, yeah, I got the Cfer for myself. And it, it really just made complete sense that this is who the Israelites really are. And, and it was really easy to see the deception. So a lot of it was through your content. And I think just through me reading the scriptures for myself and finding out the true names, like learning who the true Israelites are, learning the true name of Yah, all of this brings it all together. So that's pretty much ha how it happened for me. I mean, it, it, it's, that's, that's tough, like to swallow all that. Most people like don't swallow that. Like I'm pretty sure like your bloodline, your kinfolk, it's not easy to swallow that no one who most of us been right. Well, me, I came into this world as a Baptist Christian. All I knew was Jesus and God and Lord. That's all I knew. And it was so easy for me to make that transition, but it's not easy for everybody else to make that transition. I never understood that why people can't go from Jesus to Yahusha or God to Yahuwah. I just, I, maybe you could tell me, cause I just never understood why people fight against it so much. I recently did an episode about this on this series, and I think it's because of an emotional attachment. I think that people, like like you said earlier, when you prayed, when you were in the NFL, you called him God. Mm -hmm. And I grew up a, a Catholic until I came out of it in 2020. So same thing. I was always praying to God. And then once I learned the new information that his real name was Yah, I said, okay, he was kind of answering me when I was living in darkness, living in sin. But now it's time for me to grow and understand what his true name is. Mm -hmm. And I think when people come back to the scriptures and if they're praying in the name of Jesus or they're calling on God and they feel like their prayers are answered, I think they then refuse to change it because they say, oh, well, his name has to be Jesus because he answered when I prayed in the name of Jesus. But I think we're just not ready at the time to learn the true names. But once you learn the names, you're expected to grow and, and call the father Yah and call his son Yahusha. Mm -hmm. And as far as like my family, my bloodline, like I told them, I'm like, I told them this information. I said, we really need to have a reality check and understand who Yah's chosen people are. And that's not us. And we have to repent and cleave to the house of Jacob. So I've told a lot of people that I tell people that on my podcast all the time, if you're not an Israelite, you have to repent and cleave. And I think people don't want to humble themselves and admit the truth. Like, I think it's the same thing with everything, whether it's sports being rigged, who the Israelites are, people don't want to admit that they were wrong. People don't want to admit that they were fooled. And if I was in Catholicism my whole life, I humbled myself and rebuked it and, and forsaked it and came out of it. And people don't want to do that because they just like being comfortable, I think. Well, a lot of it has to do with their posts. Like <laughs> they seen people be like, this you? So people are scared now to turn over that new leaf and, and they don't want to get found out. They don't want to get put on blast. I, I get it. But I mean, it's just really a weak way to live. You're not really learning if you're always in fear of what you posted or what you said that goes against what you do now. I mean, it... <laughs> I don't know how many times I got this you me. I'd be like, so what? Like, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. It just shows the the glory of the most high that he can change someone around from what their past was. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a, a deep spiritual reason and an emotional connection um, as to why people can't come out of all these points. Like I think people are literally emotionally attached to the name Jesus. And I don't see why, because like we bring out the points, the letter J wasn't there. Jesus Christ is a Greek and Roman name. They whitewashed his image. So if they whitewashed his image, why wouldn't they change his name? Of course they did. Um, they removed books out of scripture, like put them in the Apocrypha. Like, so people get in this, oh, King James only is the only scripture I read. And I think that's, I think that's a big problem a as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, a, a, a huge problem because people swear and die by the King James Bible as if, God himself wrote King James Bible like he he wrote the commandments and the times when you get that it's so easy like I said it's when you grew up but it's not just this generation like you come from your parents generation their generation and that's what they've been taught they've been taught the same exact thing and they never had to to really live up to exposing these lies 
Like the, the older generation, they're cool right now. Regardless of what goes on, they're good. They don't have to change anything. We are the generation that has to change a lot of what they did. And so a lot of people are like, well, my parents got away with it. Why do I need to change it? And that's what people hang their hat on, thinking like, oh, I don't have to change. My parents were good. They, were, they didn't suffer. They didn't suffer any of these curses. So why, why should I change? And I, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a shallow way to think because, you know, that foot has to drop. If the curses hit us the same exact way and we are all God's children, look who it's going to go on to next. And people don't realize that uh, judgment and curses and prophecy are happening. And I think what you said was perfect, like with the false pagan holidays, people think, oh, well, if I celebrated Christmas for 50 years of my life and nothing ever happened to me, they don't realize that now curses and judgment are happening. So people think, oh, well, I made it this far doing it, so it, it can't be that bad. But people don't realize that the curses and the prophecies and the judgments have recently switched over in recent years and people haven't realized that yet, unfortunately. And I don't think they wouldn't. Like you would see the guy in Wisconsin <laughs> ran over people and killed them in a Christmas parade yeah. in Tennessee. Somebody else got killed in a Christmas parade. I get, until it, like I said, until it shows up their doorstep, they're never going to actually waken up to how spiritual this world works. Exactly. And that, that's this, the sad truth of it all. And as far as uh, books being removed out of scripture, I read the Sefer uh, as you do. And also as far as the pseudepigrapha books, you know, it's that two volume set. Mm -hmm. I have those two books, but I haven't read much of, into them just here and there. I'll flip through it. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think those books were originally intended to be in scripture? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I think the Testament, of the patriarchs were it meant to be in there, like the Testament of Levi, Simeon and Judah. Cause you wanted to hear more about why Simeon decided to sleep with his father's wife in his, like that's still an odd story to me. And then that cost him, that cost his literally his whole bloodline for, for not being, you know, the rightful rulers of being Kings. And it went all the way down to Judah. Uh, I think those books were supposed to be in there, but the other books, like the prayers and the odes and the stuff of Solomon, I think they could have been easily put into the wisdom of Solomon or songs of Solomon. Uh, the other books are just um, a copying like the book of Enoch and Jasher. Those books are in there too. I think they just doubled them up and just used different translations. The Greek translations have always been popular for some reason, but I think a lot of those books could have been in, in scripture. So you kind of just uh, take it with a grain of salt or just discern accordingly when you're going through those books about what might be true, what's not, and, and what should have been in there? Yeah, I cross-check a lot of stuff. Obviously, you're going to come across Lord and God. You're not going to come across Yahuwah or Elohim and those translations. But it, it's still good to read because obviously, you know, these books are coming into the in these last days. You know, you know this, the prophecy of Daniel when he says, sew up the books until the end time. So you got to keep a lot of these things a grain of salt because it's not us. It's not our, literally our bloodline that's translating these books It's our enemies translating or people who think they're doing good. There's translating them, but through European eyes. So you have to take a lot of it with a uh, grain of salt. Yeah. And what about the Testament of Solomon? Do you think that was supposed to be in there? I wish it was in there. Cause that's, it's a great book. It's, 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 it's a lot of uh, demonic activity happening in those books that makes a lot of sense, especially with Solomon, because, you know, he prayed to all these females gods. And at the end of the book, it talks about how he had to do a specific ritual in order to lay with this beautiful woman that he wanted to lay with. And he did it. And he felt the spirit of the most high leave him. Now, we could use that in our own lives. We all been in situations if we were too drunk or if we've been bed hopping, we felt that guilt and we never knew where that guilt came from. And we understood that this was the spirit of the most high. Yeah, that book is definitely important. Like with the demons being in charge of certain afflictions that the most high allows and like the demon that can go in people's dreams and disguise itself as a woman. Like I think that information is really important to know because people think they're just dreaming and like, whatever. And like a lot of our dreams are just, you know, pointless visions, but sometimes like it's definitely demonic activity. So it's, it's that, that information is important for people to know. I always joke on it when people be like, Oh, I, I you were in my dreams. Are you sure? Cause it could yeah, have been, like, you know, it was like a demon. Nice, it was <laughs> it a demon pretending to be me. Yeah. yeah. 
Because everybody does that. Everybody like, oh, you were in my dreams, and they text each other. Oh, you were in my dreams. That's the point is for you to make that connection again when you shouldn't be, uh, you know, with this person. It's always that connection that you try to have in the uh, spiritual realm. Yeah, and when we're sleeping, we're kind of like sitting ducks. Like we're not able to consciously rebuke and stuff. So that's when demons are like, all right, this is a good chance to to try something. Uh, Since this is happening right now, what is your thoughts on these Israelite camps? I think majority of the camps are pretty much put forth by Freemasons like IUIC, Israel yes. United in Christ. You see, there's even videos of them like marching in parades with Freemasons. Um, so, so I think majority, I think some camps are sincere, but I think majority of them are pretty much either put forth or they're just led astray themselves because majority of them are still talking about the Saturday Sabbath. Mm-hmm. Um, so honestly, as far as the camps, I think you definitely have to discern and, and take information from with a grain of salt from them. And I think when you're in a camp or in any group, it makes it harder to grow and evolve and learn because if, and for example, they say, uh, the Messiah's name is Yahweh Shai when it's mm-hmm. more than likely Yahusha and they say Yahweh instead of Yahuwah. So if you come to more information about the name of Yah, for example, if your camp is doing something else, it's going to make it that much harder to understand the new information because they're they're doing one thing. Then you'll have to be like dissenting among them. Right. And I only brought that up because right now they were they were protesting or standing in uh, unification for Kyrie Irving at the Barclay Center. I'm like, for what? What? Why? Why? Like. Kyrie Irving went on and apologized to the Jews. He then he apologized and said that the the video that or the link that he posted to Hebrews and Negroes was disinformation. He said this. Why would IUIC stand in front of the Barclays Center waiting for Kyrie to return? For like it made no sense to me. That's how I when I dug into who's the leader of this organization, Nathaniel Ray. He was a detective. He's a New York cop, and he was a New York cop when the IUIC was created. And when you see his preaching, oh, he's, he does all the symbolism. Some of their musical acts, they have checkerboard floors in the music video. I don't know why people can't see this. Why you think the Most High would send all these men of Israel to stand in front of a, sta- a stadium. That's like if the prophets and the disciples stood outside of the Colosseum in Rome, you know, hoping, <laughs> hoping and wishing that a specific guy didn't get tortured or whatever. Yeah, and the the fact that they're standing with uh, Kyrie should that should tell you enough right there, pretty much. Yeah. Now, Larry, I still hear you, but the audio looks like it's or the visual looks like it's frozen on my end, but I still hear you fine. So I'm not sure, sure exactly what happened. But um, we'll just keep going. Okay. Uh, so another question I have is, you know, in Scripture it speaks about wisdom. Uh, as a female, it gives wisdom, feminine traits. What about the Holy Spirit? Do you think that is masculine or feminine? It's feminine. I've read that the term Ruach is in the feminine. Now people take it as, oh, it's a a female spirit. Like, no, it's, it's soft. Everything the most high does. He doesn't, he's the only man up there. He's going to be the the man running things up there. So all of his servants, his sons, of angels, yes. But when it comes to the spirit, there's a reason why he gave it a feminine spirit. Like, we don't feel masculine when we're in the Holy Spirit and Ruach. We feel joy. It's the same way like how a young uh, woman would see her child. And since we're always looked at as the bridegroom, it would make sense for us to have a feminine spirit, a soft spirit that will, you know, teach us how to be compassionate, how to be loving. That's not a masculine spirit. I mean, the fatherly spirit is different, but the, from a, from the feminine aspect of it, the Ruach HaKadosh is like a soft feminine spirit. Wisdom is it's, it's talked about as a feminine spirit. So, you know, I, I, it makes sense to me. It, it makes sense to me as well. And even when the Ruach was descending upon Yahusha after his baptism, it says like a dove. Mm -hmm. And if you use the C for app to search for all the times dove is in there, majority of the times a dove is referred to as a her or a she. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's interesting. And it's interesting because in in I think every single uh, translation of the scriptures, when it talks about the Ruach being sent to us, it says he will give you understanding and bring all things to remembrance through Yahushua's name and everything. 
So what's the one sin that's not to be forgiven? Blasphemy against the Ruach. So wouldn't it make sense that they would mistranslate that scripture? Oh, of course. Of course. Everything is mistranslated. So it makes for the religion easy for you to say and do whatever you want and then think like, oh, I can just repent from anything. But there's some things that you can't repent from. And I think that that's majority one of them. There's a lot of things that mo people think, oh, God is a God of love. But if you read scripture, there's like five or six things that he actually hates, which is one shedding of blood, uh, lying, you know, causing strife between brethren. And then, of course, blaspheming against the uh, Ruach. Yeah, definitely. So I think that's I think that's something that not many people understand about the Ruach. So that's why I wanted to to get your thoughts on that. And I actually agree. I think. I think what you said is, is true. I agree with it. And I want to speak about the calendar a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. So I have been on Nick Vanderlane's calendar and I heard everything that you said about changing the calendar and I watched uh, Become Set Apart's video once already. I plan to watch it again. But there's two scriptures that are sticking out to me about using the moon one of them is in Enoch 80, where in line three, it says, in the days of sinners, the years shall be shortened. Mm -hmm. And then in line six, it says, and the moon shall change its laws and not be seen at her proper period. And then in Isaiah 24, it says how the moon will be confounded. So those two scriptures are sticking out to me. If the moon is being confounded or confused, and if the moon is going to change its laws in the days of sinners, AKA the end times, those two have been sticking out to me just about the calendar itself. And that's kind of what's preventing me from fully switching to become set apart's calendar. Okay. Uh, and then there's also in Jubilees, it said those will make uh, observance of the moon changing and would notice that will come day, come in, 10 days too soon. So you recalibrate those 10 days based on the spring equinox. So you would have to wait after the, the moon, the, the, the first full moon, you have to take an account that these things need to be recalibrated. So you skip all the way over to the next new moon, which is the full moon. And that's where you start the calendar. The spring equinox puts us in order to let us know, okay, we get it. We need to get ready for the new year. Then the moon changes, and then we have to wait and count to, 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 to recalibrate it. We know that the chimes are going to change. It says in Jubilee 6 that they will change, and you will notice that, that it will be coming in 10 days too soon because the moon is changing its laws. So we have to recalibrate that every year to make sure we are landing on the scriptural feast days and holy days. Yeah, that makes sense. So... I plan to, like I said, you said to watch the video several times, so I plan to go through it again. Th those were just things that were sticking out to me, but uh, that actually does make sense. So I'm still just, I don't like to just harshly change things until I really hear out the whole matter spiritually and, and really understand it. So that's something I'm still working on, but that's interesting. And the prophecy that I really like in Enoch 80 and in Second Baruch, and also in Matthew is about the time speeding up and going by faster. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on that prophecy? Man, thank you, y'all. Because, man, I could not do this if times were a lot slower. Like, you could even look back in the old days, like Martin Luther King and all those those guys were like in their 20s. They were mid-20s looking this old. So time speeding up is just, I don't want to hurry. Like, it's a sin to ask for it to be pushed and hurried. But it's like thankful because I couldn't go through Oh, this transgenderism, this gay stuff every other week, uh, it's, and these celebrities and all their little psyop and rituals. Like, it gets tiring to go through this every single week. And I'm glad that it, it's everything is speeding up because I can, you can feel it. It, it's flying. Like, it's like even this system. I don't think this system knows that time is flying by. So when they say a lie, they get caught two months later they, saying, "Oh, hey, we didn't say this." Like, yeah, fam, you said this in like August. You said this. But they don't understand that. They think like it's spread over over time. Like, oh, they're not going to find this out till like 10, 15 years later. I don't think they understand this. That's why I know that these the system that teaches religion and teaching the Bible, they're not teaching that these times are speeding up. So they, they're thinking like, oh, they're not going to figure out the truth till 20 years later. And that's why they're coming down so hard on us on social media, trying to get freedom of freedom of speech under wraps because they know the truth is speeding up. and They just can't control it.
Yeah, and the system itself can't keep up. And I think the people who are in this system can't speak, uh, can't keep up. Like they keep, like the false pagan holidays keep like surprising people and coming up on them fast. Like they literally can't keep up. Mm -hmm. And it, it's crazy because literally everybody is noticing how time is going by faster. Like unbelievers, atheists to believers, every single person. Like if you ask them, like, yeah, time's flying. Like people can understand. And then we show them three scriptures showing that it's been prophecy to happen, but people still just refuse to believe it. But everybody is definitely taking note of time going by faster. And I think through these rituals, right, you take the three football players that were killed in Virginia. You take, uh, it would have been a couple of families, four to five families that had murder, su murder suicides. You take now the four uh, students in Idaho. You take the gay nightclub shooting. This is how they do it to try to slow it down. So now they're trying to make you think about Thanksgiving to make you thankful for family. So different facets of life. You had black, white, gay, the gay community. Now you got the Jewish community. Now they're trying to slow it down with these rituals of mass death to get you to think more about these holidays. Because really, if it wasn't for the like, mainstream media, you wouldn't even knew it was Thanksgiving or Christmas and all that. That's how they're trying to slow these holidays down through these rituals of, of showing death to make you appreciative of these holidays and make you observe them more. Yeah, definitely. They, they definitely do that strategically and, and purposely by design. And uh, a moment ago, you brought up about Instagram and social media. And in your recent episode on your podcast, Sight to the Blind, you were speaking about the war that's going on, the spiritual war and how it relates to social media. What are your thoughts on Instagram? Do you ever consider getting off there for your own peace of mind or for your own well-being or do you think it's too important to get off and you have to stay on and keep fighting this war to tell you the truth i have com contemplated so many times it's just flash deleting They're just deleting and walk away from it. it it's it's putting a strain on my fiance because she's not totally awoken yet and a lot of what i say pushes off on her because she has to read like the comments i don't read the comments i really could care less uh but she's not used to being in the spotlight like that. She's real reserved. So it, all this is really straining our relationship. And I've thought a lot of, a lot about canceling and just stepping away from it because people are going to wake up anyway and they're going to do what they want anyway. It, there's nothing I'm going to do that's going to change that. It's all the most high is doing. But at the same time, the most high is giving me this word because he knows I have a problem with being idle. I do. I, if you give me too much time to do nothing, I'm going to find something to do. And it's going to lead me down the wrong, the wrong path. I just, it just takes a while for me to get there, but I'll get there if you let me not do anything. And I think right now he has me at work because this is, this is time consuming to me. I don't have to work. I don't have to do anything. So this is the work that he's put on my plate and he's put me, he's making sure I have a full load. I always uh, use this metaphor or use this parable with David. When David had too much time on his hand, what did he do? He schemed to get Bathsheba. He did all this to get Bathsheba. So the most I told him, like, look, for all your days, since you since you want to do this scheming, I'm going to make you in war. I'm going to put you in war until you can't get any rest. And the enemy is going to be the men of your own household. So that's what he's doing to me. He's making sure I stay I stay busy. Yeah. And I couldn't agree more. I contemplate the same thing. Actually, in the last few weeks, I pretty much was off Instagram, totally just giving myself a break. But I contemplate the same thing because the comments, people not understanding it, like just the the way the app is changing with all the stupidity and foolishness on there, like it, it does put a strain on us. So I was curious about that. And what do you think the main objective with Instagram and social media is? Is it to get people to repent? Is it to get people to wake up? What's the main objective in this war? It's to get people to wake Really, it's a sword. Obviously, I spiritually and physically i want to do what joshua did to the canaanites that's what i want to do but you know, obviously we can't do that we can't get swords <laughs> and pitchforks and run through cities and towns dispatching sinners and wickedness that's what i want to do to these celebrities so to me this is this is my sword this is my war and then you know people use social media to be visual i'm a visual and audio learner so i have to see it for me to learn it sometimes and i know a lot of people are like that so I use, you know, media, I use their own words, I use their own phrases, their own religions against them to wake people up. That's That's been my, my war. I enjoy doing this this type of fighting, of finding information and, and making them, you know, eat their own words. I've, I've enjoyed that.
And it's kind of important too to like spiritually cut through some of these rituals and agendas that are going on. Like even if people might not consciously know what we're even talking about, I think there's also can be spiritual implications. Like if they're pushing all these agendas, but we quickly expose it, I think that's spiritually combating them a little bit. Would you agree with that? Uh, of course. And sometimes they do mess with your pages. They mess with our pages when it's a ritual they really want to turn the volume up on. If we cut that spirit in half, they they take away some of our engagement because of that. I've, I've noticed that. What they're going to do right now is which they're going to do with Twitter. It's going to run it like Reddit. And what they're going to do is, ha is flood these pages with bots. We're going to be arguing with bots. That's what <laughs> that's basically what it is. It's going to be AI bots trying to spark madness and chaos and then they're going to move their comments to the top. So say if somebody, uh, a bot says, oh, y'all not the real Israelites. It's Kabbalah. It's this and this and that. They can load that bot up with all these likes to their comment. And it's going to draw everybody's attention to, well, if every if he says it and everybody else likes his comment, then obviously it must be true. And that's what's going to be the future of social media. They're going to, it's going to be a, like, even scripture says, like, it would be the why is going to be few and most of all those who know will be quiet so we're going to slowly be going into silence in uh in the after while yeah and i think honestly we're probably already arguing with bots uh whether they're npcs or real bots i i think we're already getting to that point one way or the other right and um so larry i know that you have you obviously have a child you have a wonderful daughter my question for you is, as this wickedness keeps increasing, as the world is getting worse and worse, closer to the days of Noah, if you will, with all this wickedness, do you think there's ever going to come a point where people should consider not uh, bringing children into the world? Or do you think that is how you step on the head of the snake? I mean, uh, I don't know if it was in Psalms, but it says, blessed is a man who has a uh, quiver full of arrows. And he was mentioning children. Yeah, because these children are going to fight your war. These children are going to be the example or the witness to their generation. And that was the whole point of the Most High giving, you know, making sure that we were married and making sure we had righteous children because we are, because you grow a nation by your children. So if your children knows or are in the truth, they make, you make it twice, you make it three times more easier for them to navigate this world and, and tread on the neck of, our enemies by having these ch these young children already in the truth. I mean, a lot of people say that oh, I'm not going to bring children in this world. Like, well, then your your foundation of family is really weak. Then, because only people who come from uh, broken backgrounds can really think like, oh, I'm not going to ever have children. And that's where this whole slogan of "F these kids" came into play with this generation because they come from single homes and they don't want to struggle with children and trying to keep them out of wickedness. And, you know, once you understand the truth, you can arm your children. You're putting armor on your children when you tell them certain things. That right now with my child, I'm already exposing her to symbolism. I'm teaching her about 666 and this system and all that. She's going to be three times ahead of everybody else in her grade because she understands what I'm telling her. Yeah, and I do see people struggling with that a lot. Like they see the wickedness of the world and and people definitely are considering whether they should even bring children into the world. But I think by not bringing in children of righteousness, that's actually doing what Satan wants. He wants us to not not bring forth seeds of righteousness. So I think um, that in a sense, by not having children is is also playing into what Satan actually wants. Exactly. If he If he can, you know, turn the order of, the woman first, the man, literally, it's the woman, the trans man, the gay man, and then the child, and then the man is way at the bottom. If he can get that order synchronized into all nations, he, he's going to win. So it's to put fear in you, like, to never want to bring children in or want to abort children. That's why this whole thing about abortion, of them taking it, off the, taking it out of the law, it's just so you can fight for it you know, three times more. They want you to want to kill your child. They want you to not ever be in a family. They want you not to reap the benefits or especially in tax taxes. They want you to fight for yourself and fend for yourself. They don't want anybody, you know, paired up. That's why so many celebrities tout their, their divorce. Their, these marriages aren't righteous, but people are fooled into thinking these marriages are righteous. And so they follow like, Oh, if they're getting a divorce and being happy, let me go try it. And then, this is when this financial system kicks in and then you won't have a leg to stand on. 
Yeah, it, it's definitely part of the agenda and majority of the people are actually falling right into it. So I think that's, that's really important. And I really just have a few more questions that, that we'll get to. Uh, I have a question about the gym and working out. Do you think it's important for believers to, to hit the gym and, and to stay active? Or do you think it's a fine line between it come it turning into vanity? Well, I mean, it depends on what you go to the gym for. Like, obviously if I sit all your joints, when you get older, your joints lock up on you. And so you go to the gym, to stay, to stay lucid, you know, to stay ready. Uh, a lot of people go to the gym to cover up what they are trying to run from. They're trying to hide from who they truly are. They're trying to run from their failures and try to cover up with a good physique. It all depends on what, you know, what fruits are being shown from going to the gym. Now, if you go to the gym and coming back, you healthy, you know, you get your, you know, endorphins and all that going, then yeah, you, you know, you live in righteously, but if you're going into the gym, to try to put on weight and get dieseled up and look cute and just so you can snap pictures of yourself all day, then that's vanity. Like, obviously, you know, it's a, it's a fine line with that. Yeah, definitely. And I think people aren't prioritizing being actually healthy. They're just focusing on what will make them look the best, but that doesn't necessarily equate to healthiness. So I think, I think it's definitely a fine line. And that's why I was curious your thoughts on it, but I agree. I think, being healthy is the most Im important part of it and not taking it too far like our society is doing. It's taking it way too far. Like I've seen, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people set up um, <laughs> their camera app apparatus in the gym. Like fam, we all know how to do squats. We all know how to do bench press. We don't need to see any more workout gurus on, on gym equipment. And it's, it's even worse for girls because this obviously, you know, girls, some of those girls get augmented and then they go in there and try to pretend like, is it coming? It's coming from the gym. It's not. It's coming from the needle. It's coming from the saw. Like I mean, but why? Yeah, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And um, what are your thoughts on the scripture Proverbs one twenty six? I love that scripture. <laughs> that is my go to scripture. You know what? I keep that scripture in the back of my head because I'm I'm the big I told you so person. I, I'm I'm a big I told you so person. When people don't believe me. I'd be like, people think I'm supposed to get upset when they don't believe me. I want you to not believe me so I can <laughs> use Proverbs 126 and use it every single day. And I think it's serious because obviously if you see this generation now, all they do is mock people and they mock them wrongly. People, we be in the, in the right and living righteously. We getting mocked. So when all of a sudden they see when we're when these curses and these plagues are not hitting us and hitting them, they are going to be like, please help me. Please help me. Please help me. Nope, Proverbs one twenty. Here come with uh, Proverbs one twenty six to to keep you upset. Yeah, people really don't understand what the scriptures actually say. Like they're like, "Oh, God is all love," and it's like, yeah, if you live righteously and keep His ways, but otherwise, like it's a whole different story. So I knew that you love that scripture, and I, I love it too, honestly. The, the funny thing about the Most High, He really is like an old school black parent, like. <laughs> It, most, if you read it, like most of his stuff is rhetorical. Like he'll, he'll give a rhetorical question. He'd be like, who else is going to tell me what to do? And you'd be like, uh, you know, we can't tell you what to do. He said, I have never came from anybody. Like, who's my parents? Who's my mother? Like he would ask those questions. It'd be like, if like you, the parents could like, didn't I tell you not to do that? I thought I told you not to do that. That's how he, he, he chastises us. I, I love it because once you read scriptures and how the most high talks, he does ask a lot of rhetorical questions. So it's going to be the same way when these people hit the, get hit with these plagues. He'd be like, didn't I tell you that Did, you didn't want to listen? Yeah, exactly. And once he starts getting rhetorical, that's that's when you know it's serious, honestly. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's when it stopped playing time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for real. That's when it's serious. So, um. I have a conspiracy question. Do you think that the mainstream can clone? You think that's real? I struggle with this because Same. I always think I know the most high said that in the end times we would, you know, man would use creation unrighteously. Of course, we know that they did it with the birds and the bees back then. It just didn't have the technology to do what we do now. Um, I think they can do it. But I don't think they would do it with celebrities because it'd be different. Like the most high give us all a soul and a spirit and we can choose for ourselves if we choose to sin or not. It just doesn't make sense for me to, for them to clone presidents 
after heaping all this sin on one individual to now clone a clone a president or a celebrity that doesn't have a soul or spirit it, it just it just makes no sense to me because the most high controls how we live and how we die he doesn't i mean it's for them to make random celeb a random um cloning got cloning celebrities doesn't make sense to me it really doesn't just because you've seen a celebrity different from when you've known them it's caused age demonic activity and not living healthy so they obviously they're going to change at a faster pace because they're in sin. They're in wickedness. So it's, it's you know, I always thought that they did, but now more I get into this truth, I, I, I think it's just all smoke and mirrors and make you think that, oh, if I die, I can come back at something else. Yeah, and we know they're definitely doing like MK Ultra mind control and stuff, but the, the cloning does get a little deep because, right, that's like transferring spirits to like another vessel and stuff. So it's like, I, I think... I think they some things they purposely put forth some conspiracies to lead people astray. Like some some of it is smoke and mirrors. So I'm I'm the same way. Like I thought it was possible, and now I'm kind of like, well, I, I, at this point, it really doesn't even matter whether they can or not. So like, who knows what they're doing? And a lot of it goes to the literally the, it's cloning, and then time travel is the next thing. They they always try to put like we can go to alternate universes and, and, and alternate universes in our minds. And they try to get us there through psychedelics. And really all that is, is this demonic manifestation. That's to shut your brain down, to shut your spirit down and let these demons take over and you become a vessel for them. So yeah, it's cloning and time travel is the one, it's the two biggest thing that people think they can actually do. And man can't do everything. Right. That That's how I feel about it. So I think, I, I think they purposely put those rabbit holes forth to to kind of put people down the wrong avenue. So that's interesting. But what do you think they do at CERN? Because I, I, I want to hear your opinion on that. I think that's definitely uh, to kick people down the wrong rabbit hole. Like people want to believe that the Mandela effect is that there's a million different universes <laughs> and they just we keep going in and out of them. There, there's no way. I believe that this is the only universe like the most high brought us here and, and that's it. And I think, I don't know what they're doing. I mean, like you said, they're probably bringing in uh, demons and, mm -hmm. and using that as a portal. Cause we know portals like that are, are ways to bring demons into the world. So, but this world is so wicked. There's demons everywhere anyway, without them even bringing them in. So exactly. <laughs> so it's like, what? so they're probably doing a whole lot of nothing. And I think the most they're doing is bringing more demons in. Um, but that's about it. I think they purposely prop that up as like, oh, this is where the Mandela effect is coming from. But I think that is definitely smoke and mirrors to get people to believe in all these different universes. Because then when you start believing there's a million different universes, you stop believing in the most high. So mm -hmm. it all goes back to scripture and always trying to blaspheme the most high and trying to get people away from the most high. And I think that's why I always bring up Mars. Like they keep telling us there's always different uh, planets that are the same as earth that can be habitable, but we keep going to a planet today thing is still red and still desert. <laughs> I'm like, I don't get why people just don't understand that there's no such thing as those planets out there. I know. And just the whole NASA thing, I, it's insane that people are still falling for it. And the craziest thing is people will be like, Oh, you don't believe the Bible, do you? And then they turn around and they believe what NASA says. It's like, bro, <laughs> like what, which is more unbelievable? Like, so the, the same people that mock us for believing scripture are the same people that believe that we can go to Mars and, and all this stuff. But it, it's it's very apparent that we're in a firmament. It, it, it's funny that you said it, because every time you meet an atheist or somebody who's not a believer, they try to make the Bible so mythical. They like, well, you're, you're talking about unicorns and dragons. I'm like, fam. The rhinoceros has one horn, so that's their unicorn that they we're talking about. And as far as dragons, do we not call those big reptiles kimono dragons? We do the same exact thing. So why would you think you were talking about a real-life dragon lizard that comes out of the sky like from like Game of Thrones or something like that? It's, a lot of this stuff is metaphors, but people really don't understand that. Yeah, exactly. And the, the whole atheist mindset is, is really mind-blowing. Like, when you really break it down, like how, like we're human beings walking around talking, like doing all, it's a miracle just to be able to talk and to walk and to do anything that we do. And then you see like the nature of like butterflies and the ants and the ladybugs and like them doing their job and moving around, like, and Proverbs 6, 6 even talks about the ant. Um, mm -hmm. Like it, I, I don't understand how people can like see all this life and creations that the father has created and just think, yeah, like we all just randomly showed up here. Like I, 
<laughs> it really doesn't make any sense to me how people like believe that. But I think people want to, they want to be atheists. Like they're proud of that. Like, so they just ignore all logic and just say, oh, well, they're atheists. But it, it really makes no sense at all. I, I almost argue with this girl that goes to my gym and she was like, oh, the man, I, the man in the clouds. So I was like, all right, so you don't, you don't believe the most high made you. So you believe that you came from an ape. Yeah. I'm like you believe that you rather believe that you came from a monkey. I have never seen a monkey or ape with full lips. So where do you think you came from? Like, how do you think you got your shade or your color? Like, it makes no sense to me that people were like, ah, the man upstairs in the clouds. Like I rather, if this, if a magical man upstairs is your theory, I would rather be kin to that rather be kin to a monkey or an ape. That's insane. It, it it's totally insane so i i think it's like a deeper spiritual meaning of these people like they're being led astray by demons and demonic influences that will not let them come to the truth of the world so they're just, atheists are pretty much just the npcs of this whole thing pretty much uh, i wanted to ask you a lot of people have asked me this question as well what are your thoughts on crystals because they try to convince me that crystals and healing is the same as what the stones were in scripture yeah, they're demonic. They're they're vessels for demons to manifest through. Like all, and even in Enoch, uh, when it talks about the fallen angels, the watchers uh, corrupting the world with darkness before the flood, it mentions uh, stones of every select kind. And the other thing it says is the fabrication of mirrors. So people don't realize that mirrors are vessels for demons to come into the world. And it doesn't just stop at regular mirrors. Like the TV is the black mirror. Our cell phones are a black mirror. Like when you look at the screen when it's off, that's what it is. So to me, that scripture is so mind blowing because it, it literally talks about crystals. It talks about the fabrication of mirrors, the beautifying mm -hmm. of eyebrows, like makeup, like, mm -hmm. like you've spoken about before. Like it's, it's, that's so mind blowing is to see where all this darkness and wickedness came from literally going back to the fallen angels, the watchers and that was before the flood, like, and right. as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be for the coming of Son of Man. Like, the same darkness is being repeated because the demons have been here this whole time. So they know right. what worked before and what will work again. So they just keep recycling all this darkness. But the new age and the crystals, the, those are just vessels for demons to manifest through. And I think the, that speaks to, like, reason why the Most High is speeding up this time, because I think he already has those he wants saved and those he knows is going to rebuild this nation already been born. So I think a lot of this stuff is going fast because he's already made his selection. I think that's a lot of people should be terrified of that, that the reason why things are going fast because the most high has already selected who he's going to save. So like, all right, now I'm ready to just destroy everything. Now get these demons to do this, 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 this and crash it. Now, literally we talk about the great reset, but the most high is going to do a reset of his own. And I think he's pushing that reset so fast because he's already on his side of it, have already saved those he knows is going to cleave to the house of Jacob and those he's going to save before he wipes this, uh, this place clean. Yeah, definitely. And that's why this, this whole great awakening has happened in recent years, because it's like, if people aren't, aren't wake, uh, aren't awakened now, it's hard to say if people ever will, like, the, the the recent years is when majority of people were waking up and some people still are coming back to it, but you could tell that great awakening what was purposeful in recent years. Exactly. So honestly, I really don't have any other questions for you, Larry. I appreciate you coming on. If you could just give some final words, some some final advice for people that are coming back to it, someone that might just be waking up or even someone that's been awakened for a few years now, what's the best advice that you can give someone to keep them on the narrow path and to keep striving and seeking the Father 10 times more? Understand that solitude is not being lonely or not loneliness. You are placed in solitude for you to grow. And or you, in order for the Most High to grow you, you have to face certain trials and tribulations by yourself. That is how you grow in your spirit. The Most High is not going to do everything for us. He give us the tools. He give us the trials and tribulations for us to grow from, for us to be stronger. And if you are a single man or a single woman, understand the Most High has your partner laid out for you. You have to meet his standards in order for him to give you the righteous partner that you deserve. And that's what you need to understand. A lot of people come to this truth and the first thing they think of is either multiple wives or where is my husband, where's my wife at? And you have to understand this is a process. I had to go through it. You have to grow as a 
righteous husband or a righteous wife before you can get your reward. And that's just that's to save you in a relationship so you don't have to use divorce as an excuse, cheating as an excuse. He's given us a way to come back to a righteous marriage so you don't have to worry ever about this man liking 50 girls Instagram pictures or this man you know, taking his shirt off and being trying to be cute for all the women to see, like he's not giving us these particular type of partners. So he's giving us people that we can grow with and stay cleave to. So when this system overloads itself and destroys itself from the inside out, we are going to be more safe and more beneficial with each, with our partner, with our significant other than we would ever be when we went through these trials and tribulations in solitude. So this is the learning session. This is the growing session right now. And you need to take it seriously and don't get upset or frustrated because you haven't found your person or you're being lonely or people are walking away from you. It's supposed to be this way. It's the wheat and the tear. And consider yourself wheat if you're hearing this message and understanding that the tears are being removed from you so you can grow in a better uh, nurturing environment. That's great advice, honestly. And I love this scripture in Tobit that says, like, she was set apart for you before this world was created. Uh, so I think people don't realize that their partners is already set. The the father already chose that person for you. But like and you, you said, have to find me, and you have to send me that verse. <laughs> you have to find me that verse. <laughs> oh, I'll send it to you. It, I, I know it's in Tobit. But um, Larry, I really appreciate you doing this. I would love to have you back on, but I know you're a busy person. So I'm just so grateful we did this. Uh, for those of you listening, you can find Larry on Instagram at 2LarryJohnson7. And his backup account is Sight to the Blind. My Instagram is WilsonRyan underscore underscore. And this is TPR, the Positivity Report. Larry, I'll send you that verse as soon as we get off the call. And thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. No problem. It you know, if down in the future, if we get to come back on and, and if something happens or, you know, you need my input or whatever, let's, let's do this again. I, I really appreciate that. And I might take you up on that. So thank you, bro. <laughs> For sure. All right. See you.